It's a real pleasure and privilege to be with you again today. And I must say how much I enjoyed listening to your singing. That's the best congregational singing I've heard for quite a long time. You were singing with your hearts and your soul, and that's wonderful. Talking to your pastor the other day, we were chatting about what I should preach on. And finally he said, Peter, I think you should preach on that subject why I am a Seventh-day Adventist. So I'm happy to do that this morning. I'd like you to take your Bibles into 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter, the third chapter, and verse 15. <clears throat> the Apostle Peter, here in the context of his letters, which are all about hope, had this to say, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks your reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Supposing I visit your home tomorrow morning, I knocked on your front door, and I said to, me, said to you, please tell me, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? Could you please show me from your Bible why you believe what you believe? Could you do it? Or would you have to kind of say, look, come back tomorrow. Let me, give me time to, to think about it. This man says, we always be ready to give an answer. So what I want to do this morning is try and combine two sermons together into one, because normally I'd preach part of it this Sabbath and part of the other half next Sabbath. So I'm going to condense it as much as I can. But I want to give you some very simple reasons why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. My first reason is very fundamental. I found a church that accepts the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation as God's inspired word. No amendations, no changes, no bringing tradition to interpret, but letting the scripture speak for itself, totally and solely, its word of truth to me. That's what me so, made me so glad when I discovered the Adventist church. It was a people totally of the book. Well, you say to me, well, what is an Adventist anyhow? If you were to look up the dictionary, the definition of the word Adventist, you'd get something like this. The word Adventist comes from the word Advent, which simply means a coming. A dictionary definition goes on, an Adventist is one who stresses the return of Jesus. Do you like that definition? One who stresses the return of Jesus Christ. Well, with that introduction, let me go right into our sermon this morning. Who was the first Adventist preacher of history? Can you tell me? Can I suggest to you that he's still alive? He's over 6,000 years old and he's still alive. Who am I talking about? Enoch. Enoch the seventh from Adam. And you read that, of course, in Jude 14 and Hebrews 11.5. Enoch, who was the seventh from Adam, said, Behold, the Lord comes with clouds. You know, let me just go back a little bit. Earlier, God had given a promise to Adam. In Genesis 3.15, we read that beautiful promise of the coming of a seed who would give his life, that the Savior of the world, it was a, it was a harbing of his coming. The Saviour would come, he would redeem man from his fallenness. And the very next thing it seems that Adam hears is Enoch preaching. Adam and Eve were still alive when Enoch was preaching. And what, was the, what does Holy Writ inspiration record as his theme of his preaching? The second coming of Christ. Behold, the Lord will come with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment and so on. Here we have, in a, an amazing way, the first advent and the second advent brought together giving us the Christian hope. The promise to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.50, and now the consummation of that hope 
with the preaching of, Ad, of Enoch. Adam and Eve must have been glad when they heard Enoch preaching that way. So, first of all, I'm an Adventist because the very message of hope emanates from the very beginning of Scripture itself. Do you know all the prophets were Adventists? All the prophets. Not only Enoch, who obviously stressed this great truth. Take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts, the third chapter. We won't look at too many texts this morning because I want to press along. I will quote many, refer to many. <clears throat> the book of Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 to 21. Chapter 3 of Acts 19 to 21. And here the apostle Peter says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Well, how about that? All the prophets proclaim this truth. And of course, if we had time this morning, and we don't, we could look at the message of the prophets. Over and over again, they were looking beyond. They were looking to the future. Abraham, although God gave him the promise of a, of a home on this earth, he looked beyond to a city whose builder and maker is God. Adam, Abraham was looking far beyond. There's a further fulfillment, a greater hope beyond. Take the book of Daniel totally focused on the coming kingdom of glory. Many wonderful prophecies. Take Isaiah, he gave many wonderful pictures of a new heaven and a new earth, the restoration that Peter just referred to here in his sermon. The time of refreshing would come and it would be a beautiful time together with our Lord. And so we could go prophet after prophet. In fact, if we look at the story of the prophets, the story of Enoch, Enoch never saw death. He was translated. And we look at Moses. Moses was buried, but he was resurrected. Why am I reminding you about this? Because isn't that what happens when Jesus comes? The living are translated, and those who have died in Christ shall be resurrected. And so the very story, the experience of these men illustrates the great truth of the Advent hope in a very wonderful way. So I am an Adventist because all the prophets were Adventists. Do you think that's a pretty good reason? Well, let me ask you a third question. Who is the head Adventist? The preeminent Adventist in Scripture. Well, that's not a very hard question to answer, is it? Jesus, of course. What was one of the great promises that we, we all know so well that Jesus gave? Can you tell me? Yes, indeed, we all know it so well. Wonderful promise. But is that all Jesus had to say about his coming? Every story he told nearly, nearly every parable focused on the coming kingdom, whether it be the story of a sower or whatever, to, and find the harvest in the end of the world. The disciples heard Jesus speaking so much about his second advent. One day they came to him and said, what shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And what did Jesus do? He preached a great sermon. Where do you find that sermon? Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. And there he gave us great countdown to the great event of the Advent, the second coming of Jesus. On the time of his, at the time of his trial, he warned Caiaphas, Caiaphas, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Caiaphas had been rebuking him and, and scorning him and mocking him. And Jesus reminded him, one day you'll see the Son of Man coming, sitting at the right hand of the power, coming in the cloud. Of... Caiaphas was, was stunned for a moment. He was gripped with fear. Then, then he reacted with uncontrolled rage, and he said, for this reason he should die. They were looking for a, a legal reason to kill Jesus. And Caiaphas thought he had it. For this reason, claiming to be that person, he should die. You could say that Jesus died for the truth of the advent, in one sense. Jesus stressed this truth over and over again, 
regardless of the circumstances. He stressed that the object, the final object of his mission, the final focus of his mission was his return in glory. He is indeed, as the scripture calls, the Lord of the Advent. I must be an Adventist too. How about you? What about the angel? Were they Adventists? It's interesting, all the Adventists believed in, all the angels believed in the Advent. Can you give me a text of scripture for that? Acts 1, 9 to 11. Remember disciples, Jesus was just descending to heaven and they were gazing up into heaven. The angel said, don't you know, don't, don't keep gazing. The same Jesus which has taken up from you into heaven is going to come in like manner even as you have seen him go. Remember that promise? They held the great truth and they went back to Jerusalem with hearts light of joy that they were going to see Jesus again. And they went out to proclaim it powerfully. So all the angels were Adventists. They believed it. I think that's a pretty good reason to be an Adventist, don't you? What about the apostles? Were they Adventists? Did they stress the return of Jesus? Well, that's a sermon itself. I want to just take three, very quickly. The Apostle Paul, the P Peter and John. Let's look at, at Paul. Paul wrote whole books concerning the advent of Jesus. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians are totally geared to the return of Jesus and what would happen when he would take place. Two whole books. Whole chapters, 1 Corinthians 15, you know that chapter so well. Handel put many of the words of that chapter to music. And we shall be changed, and mortal shall put on a mortality. Remember those magnificent words as, as Handel puts it to music. And we shall be changed. Paul, this last letter, 2 Timothy 4, his final dying testimony. I have fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge shall give to me on that day, but not to me only, but to all them that love has appeared. That was his dying testimony. Yes, Paul was an Adventist. What about Peter, the Apostle Peter? What, did, did he stress the return of Jesus? He wrote two letters, and the theme of those two letters is the living hope, being gotten again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And his last letter, he warned about those in the last days who had mocked the whole idea that Jesus was coming back. Where is the promise, some would say. Peter dealt with that. Yes, he was an Adventist through and through. He stressed this truth in those two letters powerfully and wonderfully so. What manner of person ought you to be? What kind of life should you live in view of the fact that Jesus is coming back? That was a challenge to them. Well, what about John? Was he an Adventist? Did he stress this great, great truth? Well, he wrote his gospel. He wrote those two little, three little letters, and he wrote the Revelation. How can we survey all that John had to say about the Advent? Well, let me quickly have a quick peek with you at Revelation. In Revelation, we had this phrase occurring over and over again concerning Jesus, a revelation of Jesus, speaking of him as the one who was, who is, what's the last part? Is to come. The three phases of Christ's great ministry, you might say. Who was when he died on the cross, and the book opens with that. And then the promise of him ministering in the heavenly sanctuary and then ministering to the seven churches and finally concludes powerfully so with a great chapter describing his return coming in glory. Powerful book. One who was, is, and is to come. And the first promise of the book of Revelation is found in Revelation 1-7. What is it? Behold, he comes with clouds, and what's the rest of it? Every eye shall see him. And the rest of the book is geared to showing, leading, directing to the fulfillment of that marvellous promise of hope. The book finishes with Jesus speaking personally to John. Surely I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. 
Yes, John was an Adventist. All the apostles were Adventists. They all stressed it over and over again. I must be an Adventist too. What about you? The Lord's Prayer is an Adventist prayer. The first part of the petition is, Thy kingdom come. And then come to the middle part of the prayer at the plea for forgiveness, to forgive us of sins. And the part, rest of the prayer, how to live a forgiven life, lead us not to temptation, but lead us into deliverance from evil. Why? In, t- in anticipation of the coming kingdom. And then finally it concludes, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for how long? Ever and ever, amen. Yes, it's an Adventist prayer. And everybody who prays that prayer intelligently is an Adventist. Baptism is an Adventist ceremony. Baptism is a spiritual symbolism of our death, burial and resurrection in Jesus, of newness of life now, pointing forward to the time when physically there'll be a wonderful resurrection and to newness of life for eternity, for eternity with Jesus. And Paul says in Romans chapter 6, and we shall live with him. Shall live with him. The celebration of a communion service is an Adventist ordinance. Why do I say that? What did Paul have to say about it in 1 Corinthians? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what do we do? We show the Lord's death till he come. And Jesus went on to say, I will not drink the fruit of the vine with you until I drink it with you where? In my Father's kingdom. It is an Adventist audience through ordinance through and through. You know, let me just meditate with you for a moment about this, this beautiful service, this communion service. I used to once think that the cup, the communion cup, and the wine in the communion cup represented the amazing love of God. That's true, it does. But it represents something else. And if you research this word through Old Testament and New Testament, you know what it really represents? And it's represented in the plagues again as well. The wrath of God. Represent the wine represents the wrath of God. And that's why Jesus said, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Do you know what it contains? It was a cursed cup. He was cursed for me and for you and he drank that cup. But to you and me it becomes a cup of blessing and forgiveness. It represents a new covenant relationship that I will be your God and you shall be my son and my daughter. But from Jesus' perspective, it was a dreaded cup. Just think of it. Next time you partake the communion service and that cup is in your hand, remember with what overwhelming love it speaks to you of forgiveness, of justification, of acceptance, of adoption. Because of the shared blood of Jesus, the New Testament message is in one word, already. Already. John says, you pass from death to life. How about that? Already. Paul says, you are a colony of heaven. You belong to heaven. You just happen to be living on earth. Already members of the household of faith. Already the bride adorned in the white garments, waiting for the bridegroom's coming already waiting in glad anticipation of the marriage supper of the Lamb. I say, thank you, Jesus. What do you say? Already, yes, he has prepared the way. He's opened the way to the blessed hope for you and for me. Do you see why I'm an Adventist? All the people, the best people who have ever lived are on the side of the Advent. All the prophets, 
all the apostles, all the early Christians, and towering above them all the blessed man of Calvary himself. Do you think I made the right choice to be an Adventist? Of course. But you say to me, but Peter, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Well, let's go back to the very beginning, like we did with, with the truth of the Advent, the Advent story. Who was the first Sabbath keeper of history? We know who the first preacher of history was. He was an Adventist preacher. But who was the first Sabbath keeper of history? The Creator himself. Where do you read that? Yes, I can hear it. Genesis chapter 3. And it's from that point on through Scripture, the powerful pronunciation, the powerful testimony of Scripture, God the Almighty was the creator of the world. It said he made the world in six days, and he, what did he do? He rested on the seventh. He blessed it. He sanctified it. Now listen carefully. God did not speak the Sabbath into existence like he did with the rest of creation. When he spoke and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. But when it came to the Sabbath, as with the creation of man made in his own image, he acted, he personally got involved. There's something very solemn and very special happening here. And it said that God himself rested. That God he himself blessed it. That God he himself sanctified it. That means he set it apart for a holy use to be with the one that he had just made, who had just endowed with his image. Can you picture it? Can you just picture this? When he made man from the dust of the ground, he didn't speak, but he got down there, he stooped, and with his hand so lovingly formed him and shaped him. Then he breathed into him the life, and then he endowed him with something of himself. Now from Sabbath to Sabbath, they could enjoy each other's fellowship. Something very powerful and very personal here, very meaningful, so different to the rest of creation. We need to remember that. And although men may have a hundred debates and write a hundred books, it is still an eternal truth that Jesus, the Saviour of the world, is also the world's creator who made the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Where do, you, where do you learn that truth that Jesus was a creator who rested and blessed and sanctified? John 1, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1. Remember, easy to remember when you think like, think like that, isn't it? And so the New Testament has a number of very clear, powerful passages clearly declaring that Jesus, the Saviour, was the creator, the one who rested, who blessed and sanctified the day. So men can have a hundred debates, write a thousand books, but it's still a truth, a timeless truth, that the seventh day is the day of the Lord that Jesus has made, the Sabbath. Millenniums later, following creation, Jesus was born in Bethlehem through the miracle of the Incarnation. He took on our humanity. How could he do that? Only a creator could do that. Only a creator. On one occasion, the disciples were being accused by the Pharisees of, of breaking the Sabbath, walking through the cornfield, the wheat field. They had loaded the Sabbath all kinds of rabbinical baggage and made it a burden, and there they were now judging this, these hungry disciples because they rubbed a bit of wheat together on the Sabbath so they might eat it. I want you to get the picture because a very powerful picture here. Something dramatic happens. The record goes on saying that Jesus drew near. 
came into their midst. There's something about the presence of Jesus, the mighty creator who is now the world redeemer, that every eye was focused upon him. And the Pharisees were waiting to see what he would say when they were accusing the disciples of breaking the Sabbath. And to their chagrin, they didn't get the kind of answer they were expecting. What did Jesus say to them? The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath day. How could he claim that? The word Lord means owner in its literal sense. How could he claim that? Because he was the creator who made it, isn't that it? It's so simple, it's so powerful. And he went on to confirm that he is Lord of the Sabbath and then he said, and he made it. He made it. And then he said, he made it for who? For man, that doesn't spell J-E-W, does it? Not at all. But more, there's something more quite profound in this text. He used the word for man that is a universal word for man, an all-encompassing word. In the Greek, there's more than one word for man, but the word that he used was anthropos. And what's the kind of science we get in the English word that comes from anthropos? Anthropology, yes. What is anthropology? It's a study of, of mankind, the history of mankind. Particularly, it has a focus on the origins of man. And here Jesus in this powerful text uses this word, this universal, Greek universal word for all mankind. And then he said, he, he focusing on the origin, he said he made it for man. And scholars clearly understand he's referring back to that event when he made it at the creation. And who was the man? Adam. Do you know what Adam means? Literally means the man. And Adam is the father of all mankind the father of the human race. Powerful picture. The Sabbath was made for all mankind thousands of years before there was ever a Jew. Now the record goes on and says, a withered man came to Jesus to be healed. And this is in the, on the Sabbath, on the same occasion in the synagogue. He, he wanted his hand to be healed. And the Pharisees watched him closely to see whether he would do it because that would be breaking the Sabbath according to their rabbinical rules. What did Jesus do? He says, stretch forth your hand. Now, why did he, why, why, did, did he, was he deliberately wanting to, to, to upset the Pharisees and make them angry? No. He's about to prove a very powerful, important point that he had just enunciated because he's going to do what only a creator could do, stretch forth your hand, and he healed his hand as only a creator could on the Sabbath day, showing that he was indeed the creator and the Lord of the Sabbath. He had total authority over it. It was for doing good, for blessing, for blessings. What a blessing that was to that man with the withered hand. I hear the words of Jesus. You know them so well. And in the context of the story we're just telling, if you love me, what's the rest of it? You'll keep my commandments. And at the very heart of those commandments, the very central phrase of the commandments, in other words, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. I have three questions for you. What day did the Old Testament prophets observe? Were they Sabbath keepers? Of course. Nobody just debates that. Everybody, it's a universal agreement that all the Old Testament prophets were Sabbath keepers. There's never been a d debate about this. But we have discovered, according to Holy Writ, that all the prophets were Adventists. So what kind of Adventists were they? 
They were Sabbath-keeping Adventists, weren't they? Simple as that. What day did Jesus keep? Well, of course, that's a stupid question, really, isn't it? He was Lord of the, the Sabbath. Can you give me a text of Scripture that tells us Jesus was a Sabbath keeper? Luke 4, 16 is a good one. Mark 6, 12 is another good one. And there are many instances, of course, of Jesus' Sabbath keeping. It was in Luke 4, 16, it says, As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on what day? The Sabbath day. In fact, it was on the Sabbath that Jesus announced his mission to be the saviour of the world. The very day that he claimed himself to be Lord of a Sabbath, he proclaimed that on that same day, his mission to save the lost. But we have learned that the Jesus was an Adventist. He was the head Adventist. He was Lord of the Advent. And his death and resurrection validated that powerful truth. So what kind of Adventist was Jesus? He was a Sabbath-keeping Adventist. Lord of the Sabbath. Lord of the Advent. And the cross events powerfully validate both those truths. The apostles, what about them? Were they Sabbath keepers? What book should we go to to discover whether the, whether the, the apostles were Sabbath keepers or not? What, what, what book would, would we turn to? The book of, thank you, the book of Acts. Why the book of Acts? Because it's a history book of the early Christian church. It's their story of how they lived and worshipped and follow, as followers of Jesus, how a church was organised and how it functioned. When you go home, take your Bibles and begin with Acts chapter 13. Have a pencil in your hand and begin reading. And every time you see the word Sabbath come up, just underline it. You know you'll be underlining and you'll be underlining and you'll be underlining. In fact, it's interesting, Acts chapter 30 marks the beginning of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. And immediately declares in chapter 17 that it was Paul's custom was to go into the synagogue and proclaim and preach to the Gentiles on the Sabbath day. In fact, in Acts chapter 18 has, has Paul keeping us preaching every Sabbath for 18 months at Corinth. That's how many Sabbaths? 78 Sabbaths every Sabbath for a year and a half. So, yes, the apostles were clearly Adventists. They were clearly Sabbath keepers. They were Sabbath keeping Adventists. So do you see who is on the side of the Advent and on the side of the Sabbath? All the best people who have ever lived, all the prophets, all the apostles, and again, towering above them all, the best man of Calvary himself. That settled it for me. Now that's a very simple answer, isn't it, of why I am a Seventh-day Adventist. You could give an answer like that. Very simple. It's the testimony of Scripture. It's the testimony of the lives of the prophets, of the apostles, and of Jesus himself. I need no other. Jesus, looking down to the end of time, seeing his end time church, how did he describe it? As a commandment keeping church. Those that keep the commandments of God, and what else do they keep? the faith of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. One other thing about the Sabbath. Isaiah described the redeemed in the new earth keeping and worshipping God from Sabbath to Sabbath. The scriptures show the Sabbath from Eden lost to Eden restored. No gaps. Let me bring all this together now. Two great biblical truths, as old as time itself. 
the Sabbath and the Advent. Each complements the other, combining two important theological truths that cannot exist apart, the Sabbath and the Advent. Let me explain that. The Advent tells us that our future is with Jesus. And much detail is given in scripture of what will occur when Jesus comes. Resurrection, glorification, mortal putting on immortality, uh, being made like unto his glorious body, ascension to heaven with all the redeemed of all ages. Finally, a rec we create a new heaven and a new earth. The wonder of it all, think of it, dwelling with Jesus forever. That's, that's the way it's described in the New Testament. Those are the events, powerful events. Powerful events, when you think about it. Just as powerful as creation itself. So the Advent tells us about our future and what will happen. The Sabbath tells us that Jesus, the compassionate Saviour, is also the awesome Creator. And therefore, underline this, and therefore is able to do the mighty deeds of creation that the Gospel demands and expects and promises. The Sabbath told me that my Redeemer, that kind of person, he is able to do what no one else could ever do when it comes to fulfillment of the Advent. You cannot have the creation and the gospel story separate. The Sabbath and the Advent are combined together in the person of Jesus. Think of it. Only a creator could be born as a babe in Bethlehem, rise from the dead on the third day, ascend to glory, carrying our humanity into the presence of God. Only a creator through the eternal spirit could take these hard, cold, stony hearts of ours and make them to hearts of flesh, give us a new heart, a new life, a new beginning, a new hope. Sons and daughters of God already waiting for the coming of Jesus. Only a creator could do that. Redemption is creation in another sense. Only a creator, only a creator could come again in glory, call the dead to life, bestow immortality, destroy Satan and sin, blessed riddance indeed. Only a creator. Ah, the Sabbath ever reminds me that our great Redeemer is indeed the mighty Creator. That means, underline it, that means he is mighty to save, isn't he? Mighty to save. His ability to redeem is measured by the vastness of his creation. Think of it. How this must then endow into my heart and my soul every Sabbath a tremendous sense of confidence that I come to worship him. The Sabbath told me what kind of redeemer he really is, mighty to say. Unlimited power. These two great truths are linked together in the person of Jesus Christ, my Lord, the mighty Saviour who is the world's creator, Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of the Advent. Please understand, these two great truths cannot exist apart from Jesus. They would not be if it was not for Jesus. On the other hand, take these two great, great truths away from Jesus and what kind of a Jesus is left? Weak, no hope, no creation, no redemption, no rest, no hope. 
They are bound up in the person of Christ, the Lord of the Advent, who is also the Lord of the Sabbath. Every Sabbath, and the word means rest, every Sabbath is the Saviour's invitation to you and to me to come to him that we might find rest for our souls. Isn't that it? That we might rest in his forgiveness. That we might rest in his love. That we might rest knowing that we are sons and daughters of God. That we might rest in the sure and certain hope because of who Jesus is, the creator who became the world's redeemer. It's because of that his promises are so profound, so wonderful. I well remember my dear old dad, a very godly Christian man. And uh, I used to love his prayers. And there's one favorite phrase that used to often fall from his lips when he was praying. I want to share them with you. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan reached across the span and brought it down to man. That was my dad's prayer. It can be yours too. So when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I identified with Jesus in a very special way, didn't I? Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of the Advent, and all the powerful promise and redemption and salvation that is endowed in those two terms. In fact, I joined the oldest church with the largest membership, with its truth unchanging, founded on Jesus Christ, my beloved Lord, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen.